חושב שזו הייתה דוגמה יפה, מה מחכה לנו מהדור הבא. השילוב של גילוי רבדים חדשים בהיסטוריה היהודית המרוקנית עם תיאוריות חדשות מתחום מדעי החברה, ללא דברים שהכרנו כל כך בדור שלנו. הדובר הבא הוא בא אלינו מישראל מפריז, גבריאל מונטלבנו. כמו שאמרתי, הוא הולך לדבר על יהדות בואו. הנושא ההרצאה שלו הוא Assimilation Tradition Zionism in the case of Lydian Turi. אם הוא יוכל לומר אחר כך כמה מילים על הקהילה היהודית והאיטלקית בתוניסיה, אני יודע לו זאת אומרת, I want to thank the Bentley Institute, and in particular, Hank Sadon and Judith Lovest and Private Organized and the other organizer, of course, for having organized this conference and the opportunity given to me to speak about the Libyan Jewry. I'm a first year PhD student, and my research is concerned with the Italian community in Tunisia, from the beginning of the French protectorate to the First World War. So I'm not exactly a specialist in this subject, but it is an interesting and stimulating opportunity to study other aspects of Mediterranean history and civilization. Furthermore, I want to thank my co-director, Nicola Labanca of Siena University, who suggested that I submit this paper, and my director, Gilles Pecou, professor at l'Ecole Pratique des Études of Paris. Before starting, I have to make another admission. I don't speak or read Hebrew, so my lecture will rely on English, French and Italian research that has been done about this subject. To introduce the history of the Jewish community of Libya, it's worthwhile to define some general aspects. It is important to underline that the geographical area known nowadays as Libya didn't have political or administrative unity until the Italian invasion in 1911. Regional differences in Libya were profound, and this affected the distribution of Jews in Libyan territory, which was not homogeneous. In fact, the majority of Libyan Jewry dwelt in the cities and ports of Tripolitan and Chirenaica due to their importance in trading and business. Even between these two regions, there was a strong disproportion of Jewish population. At the beginning of the Italian domination, two, two thirds of the community lived in the capital of Tripolitania, Tripoli. In Chirinaika, only the Jewish community of Benghazi reached a considerable number of members, but still quite far from the numbers of the high of Tripoli, the Jewish quarter. During the late modern history, the importance in Libyan society was notable. Nevertheless, we have to consider the small size of this Jewish community if we compare it with the other non african Jewish communities in the 19th and 20th century. To give an example, after the Second World War, there were 36,000 Jews in Libya, but 250,000 in Morocco, 130,000 in Algeria, and 90,000 in Tunisia. Regarding the history of this community before the 18th century, there is a lack of information, sometimes interrupted by documentation from the archives of Christian and Jewish organizations dealing with the release of slaves captured by Libyan crusaders. We can find some information on Libyan Jewry in Salvatore Bonus' work, Storiografia e Fonte Occidentale sulla Libia. Between 1551 and 1711, the Libyan regions were directed under the rule of, Ottomans, of the Ottomans. A period of independent government took place in Libya with the Karamanli dynasty between 1711 and 1835. According to the Felicius book, it seems that during this period the Jewish condition improved thanks to their participation in this autonomous government. With the return of the of Ottoman power in 1835, Libyan Jewry was more connected culturally and economically with the other Mediterranean Jewish trading with, within Ottoman borders. 
With the birth of Italian colonial aspiration for Libya at the end of the century, the government in Rome wanted to use for its own designs the descendants of the Caramalli dynasty in, the, or in order to establish and legitimate an Italian protectorate. This attempt to use a local dynasty against the authority of Constantinople failed soon. Despite the important role of Libyan Jews in the economy of the country, social and economic differences were strong among Jews. The number of those in need of a Jewish charity institution remained high until the mass migration to Israel, the Aliyah. Thanks to the social and cultural analysis of Rachel Simon, it is possible to define the social discrepancies of these Jewish through linguistic and cultural evidence. On the one hand, the poorest, the poorest were closely interwoven with Arabic and Muslim society and spoke Judeo-Arabic. On the other hand, the richest, the richest Jewish who traded with other countries spoke the Italian language and were keen to start a process of modernization of the Libyan Jewry, which was strongly characterized by superstition and poverty at the time. The Italian conquest marked the beginning of a period of, a great, of great changes and challenges for Libyan Jewry. At the end of the 19th century and during the 20th, the Libyan Jewish community was, was strongly influenced by two main factors, Zionism and, after the colonial occupation of Libya, Italian assimilation. First of these changes took place clearly in 1911 at the time of new European rulers in Libya. <coughs> The Jews of Tripolitania supported openly the Italian invasion, hoping for an improvement of their condition in comparison with Muslim and uh, Ottoman ones. The upper segments of the Jewish community of Libya became, at the beginning of the Italian period, the real intermediary between the Italians and the Arab Berber population. At the beginning, the Italian governments didn't want to concede any privilege to Jews in Libya, but they had to because of the importance Jews acquired in the economy and the administrative <coughs> field. During the liberal and the fascist period, the behavior toward the Jewish community was complementary to Italian-Arab relations. Clearly, this sort of collaboration increased the diffidence and the hostility of the Muslim population, especially the nationalists, against the local Jewish community. Soon, the relationship <coughs> between the Libyan Jew and Italy revealed some disagreements. Italian rulers at the start of the colonial conquest underestimating and overlooking the political, social and geographical condition of Libyan area. They did the same with the Libyan Jewry, simply approaching it as they would have done with the Italian Jewish community which was culturally European and well integrated in the national customs of Italy's kingdom. The Italian Jewry likewise hadn't considered the profound differences with this North African community. The aim of uh, Italian colonial administrators towards this jury, this jury was at the beginning to fill the social and economic gap that distanced it from the national one. But the differences were bigger than expected. Local rabbis were not inclined to align Libyan Jewry with the Union of Jewish Communities in Italy, as encouraged by Italian colonial authorities, and they didn't accept easily Italian rabbis to lead Libyan Jewry owing to the difference in custom, tradition, and rituals of Libyan Judaism. As the historian Simon Maxine Dumont said in her article, Italian Jewry had a mediating role between the Libyan one and the central government. Its loyalty to the Italian nation was beyond doubt, as is shown by the support of the Italian Jewish Council for the invasion of Libya. The aim of Italian Jewry was to free their oppressed Libyan brothers from Muslim rule within the Italian nationalist project. Italian Jewry acted at the same time to protect Libyan Judaism and to enlarge the Italian influence. For this reason, the Italian Jewish Committee, directed by Sereni, wanted to restrain the teaching of Alliance Israelite Universelle, which was in French. From the conservative side of this community, there was a strong resistance towards innovation coming from the new rulers. Whilst the conservatives were often the religious and the poor people of the Hara, the other represented the Jewish bourgeoisie and traders of Tripoli city. First, Zionist activities belonged historically to this social group. Even if it was a small group, it was linked to international Zionism. According to Romani's research, in 1892, some exponents of Libyan Jewry met Theodor Herzl in Constantinople. 
the importance of the link between Libyan Jew and Zionism was confirmed in 1809 by the proposal of the Jewish Territorial Organization to examine whether Libyan territory, precisely Cyrenaica, was apt to become the land of the Jewish settlement. Herz himself talked to Vittorio Emanuele III, King of Italy, about the possibility of the European Jewish settlement in Cyrenaica. Despite its, its uh, early beginning, Zionism in Libya had changing fortunes. After establishing the first Libyan Zionist organization in 1912, enabled also by the contacts with the Italian Jewish movement and its Zionist press, the response of the Tripolitan community was quite quick. However, Osim Benghazi, a small group, was formed. One of the purposes of these Zionists was Judaizing the Jewish masses so as to protect it from the danger of Italianization and assimilation. In order to face this problem, in 1916, the Zion Society, Circolosium, was founded and its leader was Elia Naisi. The teaching of Hebrew was considered as the main task of this society to pave the way, to pave the way to a Jewish national awakening. The third is so a real reprise of Zionist activities promoted by an organization called Ben Yehuda, which intended to improve Jewish culture through the teaching of the language, books, association, and other cultural activities, all made possible by fundraising. In 1932, it financed entirely the whole, the whole Jewish educational system in Tripoli. In Benghazi, it was limited to Hebrew and religious teaching. The fear of Arab reaction and the policy, the policy of Italian colonial authorities prevented the further Zionist activities. Some problems and clashes with Italian authorities occurred in 1923 and 1937 because of the, differences, the, the difference between Sunday and Saturday day as rest day during the week. Anyway, it's quite inappropriate to talk about a real anti-Zionism of fascism during the 20s. For example, when, in 1926, the Libyan Zionist movement wanted to publish a newspaper, Emilio de Bono, the fascist governor of Libya, asked the permission of Dino Grandi, under Secretary of Foreign Affairs, who agreed in trying to use Zionism as a tool of fascist imperialism. Otherwise, the minister of colonies, Pietro Lanza di Scalea, even if he agreed with Grandi's idea towards Zionism, did not want to retake the Arab population of Libya and stop the Zionist publication. This event confirms the opportunist attitude of Italian fascism towards Zionism. Of course, this situation changed in the 30s. Fascist Russian laws in 1948 and the Second World War threatened directly the Zionist movement and the whole Libyan Jewry. It would be long and maybe off topic to draw out about the anti Semitism of Italian fascism. Summing up the interpretation of De Felice, Matar Bonucci, and other historians, we can state that fascist anti Semitism started during the 30s and precisely after the racist propaganda during the Italian aggression on Ethiopia. This is not to underestimate the fascist persecution against Jews in Italy and its causes as the one suffered by Libyan Jewish in Jado's concentration camp during the war in 1943. After the Second World War, Zionist awakening took place encouraged by the participation of the Jewish Brigade in the British Army, who had an important role during the military offensive in Libya against Nazi fascists. The whole, the, the whole Jewish organization started their activities again, and new ones were created in these years. The soldiers of the Jewish Brigade had an active role in these Zionist activities. If some considered Zionism a national identity, others, indeed most of the Libyan Jews, looked at it as a way to modernize and preserve the Jewish tradition and religion in post-war Libya. Conversely, the English administration, like the Italian one, did not want trouble with the Arab population and forbade the official reconstitution of the local Zionist associations. If we want to subdivide the chronological the history of Libyan Jewry, the turning point won't be the World War II, even if so important to this community, but the program of November 1945, which changed the mind of Jews about their future relations with the Arab Berber population. Between 1944 and 1945, nationalist and pan-Islamic ideas 
were on the rise among the Arab and Indian urban middle class. Accusations against Jews of usury and greediness became common among the Indian people who suffered the economic crisis of post-war. The progress of this nationalism was linked to the return of Libyan exiles who were supporters of the nationalist movement. The pogrom started in Tripoli city and spread to the surroundings. 130 Jews were killed in the devastation of synagogues, shops, habitation, forced another 4,000 to leave their houses and quarters. The damage to property was estimated around 300 million of pounds. The British military administration interpreted this problem as no more than a riot which had gotten out of hand and didn't research for any political motivation. Moreover, the British military administration was talking about an Arab reaction against the Zionist activities in Libya, suggesting that the Jews would have been guilty for their own massacre. Historians on the contrary have argued that the role of the Arab nationalists was evident if we consider the speed of the organization of this program and its diffusion in Tripolitania in place of control by nationalists. To confirm this hypothesis, it's worth noting that, the, that many of the rest belonged to its al Watani, the Libyan Nationalist Party. The program of 1945 changed not only the relation between Arabs and Jews in Libya, but also and above all the possibility for Jews to stay in Libya, where they had lived for 2,000 years. The British administration had revealed its incapacity to prevent and to defend the Jewish community from these kinds of danger. The possible establishment of a Jewish protectorate over Libya at the time started not to be welcomed positively by Libyan Jews. Then two main tendencies would characterize now the Jewry, the one in power of Italians and the suggestion of an Italian protectorate over Libya after post-war treaties, and another one arguing for a peaceful relation with Arabs and supporting Libyan independence in order to emigrate as soon as possible. Another great clash came up with the proclamation of the State of Israel in 1948 and the consequent Arab-Israeli war has happened in the rest of Arab lands, a wave of hostility emerged against the Jews. The Jewish community in Libya suffered another terrible problem, although less bloody than the one in 1945, thanks to the reaction and the capacity of the self-defense of Jews. The possibility of the Italian protectorate that, according to some Jews, offered a better software against the Arab rights was rejected and the United Kingdom powered a future independence of the country. The idea to live with Arabs in independent Libya was unrealizable after these disasters. There was no future for Jews in Libya and the two programs and the hostility of Arab nationalism confirmed the necessity to emigrate. According to the president of the Jewish community of Tripolitania, Moshe Nahum, all Jews of Tripolitania wanted to leave the country. In 1949, when the UK removed the interdiction to emigrate, the great Libyan Jewish exodus, the Haliyah, started. Just to have an idea of this massive immigration, it is sufficient to consider that at the end of 1950, 20,000 Jews left the country and other 12,000 had made a request to immigrate. Only 1,200 had demanded the expatriate to expedite at the immigration office. International Jewish organizations had an important role to facilitate the immigration, like Organizzazione Sanitaria Ebraica, financed by American Jewish Distribution Committee's medical department, who cared for the sick Jews who wanted to emigrate. Without the financial, medical, and political aid of the Jewish international organization, the area of Libyan Jewry would have been possible. When, in 1951, Libya became independent with King Idris I, Libyan Jewish population amounted to less than 6,000 members. The friendly statements of King Idris I and his personal protection of Libyan Jews couldn't hide the nationalist street. In 1953, Libyan joined the Arab League and the government adopted some anti-Jewish and anti-Israeli restrictions in order to boycott Israel. For example, Libyan Jews who took residence in Israel were not allowed to come back to Libya. It's clear that the Jews who remained in Libya were vulnerable to the international political situation, in particular, Arab-Israel relations. The end of the history of Jews in Libya came with the social and political tension caused by the outbreak of the Arab-Israeli war in 1967. The mob attacked once more the Jews and destroyed in Tripoli City 60% of the Jewish properties. 
Martyrs were committed against Jewish Metropolitan in Cyrenaica. Libyan nationalism was excited by this war, and the guardians of Idris I were useless against the Raj father fed by nationalists. There was only one solution Jews had to evacuate Libya. The diplomatic role of Italy, which was the second destination of Libyan Jewish migrants, was very important in this humanitarian crisis. It offered hospitality to Libyan Jews, even for those who didn't have Italian nationality. In June 2800, Libyan Jews arrived in Italy. The idea, of a, the, the idea of the Libyan government was to evacuate temporarily the Jews from the country, waiting for a better and common situation. But the political conditions were worse with the Gaddafi scoop in 1969, especially for the minorities living in Libya. Gaddafi's Libya was one of the most obstinate enemies of Israel state, and this political and ideological position didn't improve the condition of the few Libyan Jews who remained in Libya and the hopes of those who emigrated in Italy to Italy. One of the first provisions was the expulsion of all Italians, English and Americans from the Libyan territory. In 1970, Jewish assets were put under said administration. After some months, the same law was extended to Italians so as to confiscate permanently their properties in order to avenge the colonial oppression. As a Roman who writes in his book, in 203, the last Jew of Libya left the country, the last witness of a great community which had, which had lived there for 2,000 years and is now divided between Israel and Italy, having disappeared from the Libyan soul. The decline of Libyan Jewry, that is their massive migration from Libya, is a striking example of the general decline of Jewish civilization in Arab lands and in Mediterranean basin, which occurred during the 20th century. Thanks.